But I'm afraid, I'm afraid that you may be arriving under false uh, assumptions. I don't, I don't know how this happened, but somehow two became four. Um, uh, Patrick announced four something or others from the pulpit because it says, what I sent in uh, was two different things. I'd like to talk today about a monastery and a saint associated with that monastery. And next time about another monastery and a saint associated with that monastery. That makes two monasteries and two saints. But somebody saw that there were two nouns in each thing and added up to four, so it says four. You're only going to get two monasteries, so if, if, if you feel you've been cheated, this would be a good moment to deplane. Um, but uh, these, are, these are both places seems to me of enormous importance in the modern world, in the history, in world history, or at least in Western world history, and in the, in the history of, uh, of the Western church. One of them is, and both are places with which I've been associated for various reasons. Maybe you know that I'm a scholar of medieval music. So what I do is just go around and look at, at really old manuscripts wherever they are to be found which is really fun. I mean, the real joy, one of the real joys in my life, besides, of course, coming to church here, is, um, is holding in my hands a thousand-year-old book and singing from it the same music that fellow human beings sang holding this same book in their hands. It's a kind of magical time travel to be almost physically in contact with fellow human beings a thousand years old. And we, and we sing the same music still. Anyway, so today's monastery is Monte Cassino, which you will know from, for various reasons. Uh, this is just that orange arrow just points to where Monte Cassino is on the Italian peninsula. It's about halfway between Rome and Naples um, on top of a very tall, there's exactly a giant mountain behind it, but it's on top of what would be a big mountain anywhere else, um, and you see it from anywhere. If you take the train from Rome to Naples, you will not miss Monte Cassino over on the side. Um, a big, big, impressive building, very hard to get to. You go way up the hill. It's very famous as the place where St. Benedict essentially uh, started the Benedictine order and wrote the rule of St. Benedict on top of that hill at that place, and also famous for a lot, uh, for a lot of other people, for the fact, uh, for the big bombardment of 1944, it was blown off the top of its mountain by our side. Um, convinced incorrectly that the Germans were occupying the monastery at the top of the hill, they were not, in fact. Um, but when you take the train down from Naples, you understand that it's a it's a strategic place. And if the Allies are trying to move north towards Rome, part of them come from Anzio, but a lot of people have been slogging up from Sicily, and you see this great big thing up there, and you know that the Germans are somewhere. It, uh, it was very hard, I guess, I wasn't there for our side, not to blow the thing off the top of the mountain. The result, of course, is there you see the arches at the front of the big basilica of Monte Cassino, the main church of the monastery. And here's what's left of the big statue of St. Benedict at the foot of the stairs that go up to, the, to the, um, the Galilee that leads into the church. Not much left. Um, with a lot of help mostly from uh, the United States and Western Europe, from the Allies, who we all probably feel, I wasn't there, but we all feel sort of bad about the fact that our side blew the monastery off the top of its hill, it's been built back, essentially exactly the way it was, um, uh, using, using the, old, the old Renaissance plans. And when you go to visit it today, you see just what, I mean, one of the interesting things about it is that most old things that we venerate and we go to see them because they're so old were not built to be old. They were built to be new. But when we see them, they're old. So we think old, you know, you got to be old in order to be important. Well, you can be new and be important too if you're, if you're the 
a mother house of Western monasticism. Um, and there was a time when this was new, and seldom do we get the chance to see something that was built to be new, new. But that's what you see when you go there now. This is the top of the hill. And those five, the five arches on the outside wall there allow a fantastic view from inside. Uh, that, that's those arches looking the other way. There's a courtyard to the left, a, a cloister to the left, a cloister to the right, this central cloister with the well, the statues of St. Benedict and uh, his sister, St. Scholastica, at the bottom of the stairs. Um, amazing view. There's a great big Fiat factory down in the plain now, which wasn't there when the Allies came by. It certainly wasn't there in St. Benedict's day. Um, uh, so there's the arches again with the, uh, with the uh, crane and the, and the well, and there's a whole bunch of people going through the arch into the cloister that's in front of the basilica, which is there. One of the great features of this uh, building, this is the Renaissance part of it, is this amazing long straight corridor. Can you see this corridor on the right? It's about, uh, I don't know, it feels like it's about a half a mile long and you can sight down the whole thing. You don't normally get taken in there because that's part of the monk's enclosure. Um, but it has cells on either side. It also has an apartment for the king of Naples if the king of Naples should ever want to drop by. Um, and uh, I have actually been, been through there. Uh, I took a group of students which was all men except for one woman, and, and poor Natasha had to sit out in the cloister while Don Faustino took all the rest of us down through this cloister and all through these marvelous things. It was very kind of Natasha to be, but she was pretty grumpy when we came back. I'm sorry to say. Um, there's, there's the statue of St. Benedict put back together. Um, and if you go up those stairs, you pass through one of three arches towards the church, and there's the church in front of you. People like to pose at the top of those stairs. There's Natasha. <laughs> this is before we all, all the rest of us, went to see the corridor because she's still in a good mood. Um, here's, a, here's another group. Uh, oh, I should, have, I should have pointed out in, right in the center is um, Don Faustino Avagliano, the then librarian of Monte Cassino. He's died since, I'm sorry to say, a charming man. Um, and the current librarian is not the tall guy with the beard, but the shorter one with glasses in the front row. This is a group from a university in Krakow that I toured around uh, in a course last summer. Well, the place is there. It's, it's beautiful. You can go and visit it. Lots of people do. It's also, as I say, here's Here's a picture of St. Benedict from a manuscript, um, and, and to St. Benedict is being presented the book in which this illustration happens by, by the abbot of Monte Cassino, uh, Mr. Desiderius. He's wearing his square halo, which means he's still alive at the time the, uh, he's represented in this picture. And he say, Father, with them, um, Father, with all these buildings, please accept also many books. And there's a big pile of books down here. Desiderius rebuilt the church, caused many, many, many beautiful books to be written. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's a, the beginning of the rule of St. Benedict. Um, this is one of the many manuscripts there are because every Benedictine monastery needs a copy of the rule because you need to write, read from it every day. Um, this is not the one that St. Benedict wrote. Uh, but this is one of many. This is one um, written at Monte Cassino. So that's Monte Cassino. Beautiful place. Mother house of Benedictine monasticism. Always been there. Always will be there. That's the legend. Now let's start again and talk about reality. So there are a lot of things that have happened to uh, Monte Cassino since it was founded. Mostly it's been destroyed a bunch of times. Um, as you can see here, um, maybe you can't read this, but it's, um, it's in the 6th century, 527, that, that Benedict, uh, a young monk who was born in what's now called Norcia, 
which is a, a, a place in Umbria uh, famous for sausages and processed pork products. Norcinaria means stuff from Norcia. Anyway, and then he went to, he was educated in Rome and he became a monk by himself for a while, was in Subiaco for a while where he gathered some people around him. And then he came down south to try to get away from it all and on the ruins of a, of a Greek temple at the top of a mountain founded a monastery that's now called Monte Cassino. We know everything, and then of course it gets destroyed shortly 50 years later. It completely destroyed and everybody gone. Um, and the monks, the monks there are go to Rome. And it's in Rome, the monks who have fled Monte Cassino, that St. Gregory the Great learns about St. Benedict from some of the surviving monks. Gregory is dead now, but he, in, in his book called the uh, Dialogues of Gregory, the second book of Gregory's Dialogues, is a biography of St. Benedict, and that's the only historical information we have about St. Benedict, is written some 50 years after Benedict's death by Gregory the Great. But it sounds like partly historical. There are a great many miracles and wonders and so forth in the story, but the story also is historical and pegged to historical places. Um, so then it gets, uh, they refound it again in 725, uh, the 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 the, uh, the Saracens, as they call them, the Arabs, the, the this this new religion, uh, this new religion that comes from the Middle East, destroys it again. Then, uh, after they refound it with a new set of people from up north, then Abbot Desiderius, whom you saw a minute ago, who later became Pope, the uh, Monica Cassino rises to the height of its power in the 11th century, and they have a navy. They own land all the way from Monte Cassino all the way up to Rome. They have several churches in Rome, including the Church of Santa Cecilia and Trastevere. They, uh, they become abbots of lots and lots of daughter houses all over southern and northern Italy. It becomes a huge, powerful institution. Um, and, and Desiderius, in addition to all those books you saw, builds a brand new basilica, rebuilds the monastery, and of course the whole thing gets knocked down in 1349 by an earthquake, then a whole bunch of other people, then they bring some more people, then they build a big fancy Baroque thing in the 17th century, which is destroyed in 1944, and it's then rebuilt um, in, uh, um, again, as it was before. So, to say it's always been there and it's always been like this is to subscribe to a, a, a wonderful but false idea. It's okay. I mean, it's still, it is nevertheless the place. And there's something about the place itself. It's the place. It is the place where Benedict went. He must have gone on this Roman road, the via, now called the Via Casilina. Uh, because it's the street, that, the road that leads from Rome to Cassino. Anyway, on that road, and this is at the, uh, this is the ruins of the Roman city of Casinum. Um, uh, uh, and it's on the mountain above Casinum that Benedict went. And in fact, in the very bottom of the, of the foundations of the monastery are these giant stones, which are, that's the corner of a Greek temple. There was a Greek temple up there, as it turns out. An awful lot of what happened, of how the, of the history, the physical history of the monastery, is something that we learned as a result of the bombardment of 1944. It was possible to find out a lot of stuff that you couldn't find out without taking up floors and knocking down the walls. But since the Allies took care of that, we could uh, take advantage of the fact of uh, doing a little bit of um, excavation. So a little bit of excavation happened, and one found various kinds of things, little bits also of the very famous Basilica of Abbot Desiderius in the 11th century. Um, Abbot Desiderius is, for everybody, the high point. We don't know exactly what his new beautiful basilica looked like because, of course, it got destroyed and rebuilt in Baroque style like the one we have now, or Renaissance style. Um, but we have a very, very detailed description of the 
of the dedication of the Basilica of Desiderius by the Pope and all the cardinals who came and all the potentates and all the kings and emperors. And in the Chronicle of Monte Cassino, there's a very, very, very detailed description of every aspect of the Basilica, how long it was, what the floor decoration looked like, what kinds of screens and chandeliers and things there were inside and outside. And so the art historian Kenneth John Conant made a stab at a reconstruction of what the monastery of Desiderius, Desiderius' period, looked like and what the basilica itself looked like. This is the, the, the Conant's hypothetical reconstruction using the description of the Chronicle of Monte Cassino of a beautiful church. Another way of finding out what the great basilica of Desiderius might have looked like is to go to some of the churches that are daughter houses of Monte Cassino that were built by Desiderius or by monks of Monte Cassino. So if you go to the Cathedral of Salerno, you will see a church that was built by a guy named Alfano, who was a monk of Monte Cassino under Desiderius, became bishop of Salerno and decided to rebuild the cathedral along the lines of the, of the Basilica of Desiderius. And that's the Cathedral of Salerno, and it looks very much like that, although a lot of other stuff has happened to it also. Or there's the smaller church of Sant'Angelo in Formis, outside of Capua, up in the hills. It's a smaller church, but it was built by Desiderius himself on the model of his bigger basilica. And it's there, which is something you can't say about the uh, basilica in Monte Cassino. It's there and you can visit it. It has a wonderful fresco cycle along the walls. Scenes from the New Testament, scenes from the Old Testament in a register above. Lots of interesting things, including a portrait of Desiderius himself presenting the church. This is how you do it. You pre presenting the church to whatever it is. And there it is. There's the church of Sant'Angelo in Formis. And there's, and there's Desiderius, the patron the commissioner of the church. So we can come close in our imagination to what Monte Cassino looked like at the absolute height of its power because it was not just an ecclesiastical place, but it was a place where kings and emperors came to say hello to the nobody of any importance passed by without stopping and, and making a visit at Monte Cassino. It had enormous political as well as religious influence. One of the things that does survive from the, uh, it's miraculous, from the Basilica of Desiderius is the great bronze doors. There's my friend Don Faustino again. Peggy knows him. We've met him a couple of times. Um, uh, those, the bronze doors commissioned from Constantinople specifically for the Basilica of Desiderius. Tourists like to pose there too. Um, but uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's made up of a series of individual panels, and the panels, all of those panels are engraved with the names of possessions, daughter houses of Monte Cassino. Um, and there are a lot of them, as you can imagine. I don't want to go read you the whole set of doors, but just from this one, maybe you can see, this is Civitella in Celera, uh, somewhere, St. Benedictus de... De Crema, Sancti Benedicto de Pastorano, de Juxta Nonantola. That's way up north, Nonantola. But they have a monastery up there. Um, uh, Sancti Benedicti, oh no, uh, Nonantola, Juxta Arezio, not far from Arezzo, is what it says. And then here's Sancti Benedicti. And so it's a list of all of the daughter houses and possessions of Monte Cassino. So we, we may be very religious and introspective and say our prayers here, but we want everybody to know. Um, there also are a few, a few sections, a few small sections of the very, very beautiful mosaic pavement of the, of the Desiderium Basilica. We actually have a drawing of the pattern of the pavement of the basilica, um, which was uh, um, uh, Cosmati style like this.
but acres and acres of it, and only a little bit of it survives. So this is perhaps what it looked like in the time of Desiderius. Um, and it still looks shaped a little bit like this. That is, you go in, you go in here in, in a tower. This is the outline. And uh, this is the outline of the Church of St. Martin, which is the first church that St. Benedict built and the church in which he died. St. Benedict died, he said he did not want to lie down, he wanted to die standing up praising God. And he was supported by two of his monks while he died, and he died standing up. And, and, and after the bombardment, um, Don Angelo Pantoni, a monk of Monte Cassino, but also a great archeologist, found the outlines of the church of St. Martin right there and they are now marked in the pavement of the courtyard, and there's a statue of St. Benedict and two of his monks. Very touching. So all the things that we read in the Chronicle, they're not making this up. These physical things really do exist. And this was the first place that Benedict built, and its outlines are still to be found. But this, after the earthquake, gets replaced by this. Here you can see this enormous long corridor. Um, it, it doesn't look like much here, but it's really impressive when the end of the corridor is so far over there that the, that the, the great big arch at the end looks to be just, anyway, it's really, really cool. Um, uh, this is, the, this is the, the version that we see now, essentially. Here's the stairs that go up here, here's the next big courtyard, um, and uh, more stairs up here going through three arches in the next courtyard, and then the church, so on. Um, so this is the place. Um, al although the church actually got rebuilt and redecorated in sort of 18th century Neapolitan style with lots of colored marbles and things like that, lots of really gaudy paintings. And uh, if you're going to knock one thing down, that would be the thing to knock down. Um, um, but they built it back in the 19th century style and they commissioned a lot of people to put a lot more gaudy paintings in there. You'll be happy to know. So when you go, it'll be a little bit of a disappointment when you go into the church. Um, so Monte Cassino was the origin of Benedictine monasticism. We'll get to that in a minute. But it also was a great repository of learning of all kinds. St. Benedict wants his monks and, and, and sisters to read. That's one of the things you do is Lectio Divina. You need a lot of books. Well, Monte Cassino collected and created one of the largest medieval libraries there was, and it survives. You'd think it wouldn't because the place was blown off the top of its mountain in 1944. As it happens, a German officer, uh, way beyond his rank, he, he didn't really have the authority to do this, caused the library of Monte Cassino to be crated up and sent to the Vatican. And so when the, the monastery was destroyed, the library was not destroyed. And it has been brought back to Monte Cassino, and it is one of the treasures of, of medieval culture. Um, it has classical texts that don't exist anywhere else. We, we, there are some texts we would not have if it were not for the copy made at Monte Cassino. There are also a great many other books of various important kinds and lots of beautifully decorated books. This is a, a book from the Desiderian period um, that just has some, some of the gold decoration of the sort you would get used to. Here is an earth, there are lots and lots and lots of fragments. Desiderius caused a lot of old manuscripts to be discarded when he presented this huge new set of books to uh, St. Benedict, one of the things he did was get rid of all the old liturgical books and make all new liturgical books, which also seemed to be a new kind of liturgy completely in line with the liturgy of the Church of Rome, which they were trying to do now. Before Desiderius' time, they had their own little South Italian way of doing things, and they didn't care who knew about it. But Desiderius didn't want to be anything other than uh, uh, orthodox and right in line. So all of the older books from Monte Cassino were either 
purposefully destroyed or else didn't survive because we had all these new ones. In any case, when you find older books that were uh, pieces of little sections of older books, um, that's of particular interest to me. So I've gone around and just looked at all the little fragments. Here's a piece of an even older book used as a repair. Well, that's pretty interesting to me anyway. Not everybody cares about that kind of thing, but I do. This may be the oldest musical notation that survives from Monte Cassino. So most of the books at Monte Cassino were written in a wonderful, beautiful script that we now call Beneventan script because it probably originated in the city of Benevento and uh, Monte Cassino and most of southern Italy were in an area called the Duchy or, or the Principality of Benevento, first the dukes, and then after a while the dukes decided to call themselves princes. So they call this Beneventan script, and I'm sure you'll find it easy to read. <laughs> yeah? Well, it's actually not hard. What it says is, Nisi granum frumenti cadens in terram mortuum fuere, right? One of the tricks is that the T looks like an A, and the A looks like a T, and the R looks exactly like a T. So here's a T-R-E-S. That's what a T looks like. That's what an R looks like. You see, you see the problem. The difference between an A and a T is that a T is straight across the top, and, a, and an A is not. T-R, T-R-O, that's T-U. That's one of the problems. Another problem is the ligatures, two letters written together. So, and one of the great uh, ligatures is the T-I ligature. Because T-I can be pronounced two different ways. It can be pronounced T or C. Like not C-O or Fiteritio. Uh, and they have two different ligatures for that. But it says terz, uh, there's this, this one that looks like a kind of an ampersand for the tz sound, terzia, prescriptio, but tristi, si, ah, t i t a, tristi, si, ah. See? <laughs> well, it's really interesting because that gives you actually something of the sound. They are actually writing what they hear. They're writing the sound of the language, and it can tell us something about how Latin was pronounced over time if we can find clues like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a historical linguist, but that it's, sort of, it's sort of interesting that the sound is involved in the writing. And a lot of what we call copying may actually be writing down what somebody in the scriptorium is reading out loud, and three people are making simultaneous copies of it. Because we do have copying errors that are obviously errors of hearing rather than looking. You see what I mean? So, anyway, so those are just, that's all you need to know to read this. <laughs> and there's the part on the left, and there it is on the right. Nisi granum. That's not a T, that's an R. That's not a T, that's an A. And so on. This is an agreement. This is T I through men T. Not from men C, but from men T. One of those TI ligatures. Cadens in terror, this is an abbreviation. Terram mortuum fuere. Anyway, we're not going to have a test afterwards. But it's one of those things, like learning your Greek alphabet. Once you learn it, you can't believe it was ever hard. I promise you, you know, half an hour, you can read this stuff right off. But it, and it's very, very beautiful. It, it's a character. Anytime you see this writing, you know that this that the manuscript came from Monte Cassino or somewhere around there, because it's only in Latin southern Italy, south of Rome, and above the Greek part, a little bit farther south, that this script was written. So there he is again. This is our God Desiderius, and when he says, "Please take all these books, Father, Father Benedict." It means more to us than we thought it did. It might mean I'm getting rid of all the old literature, so of, of, of all the old liturgy, so that nobody will know we were ever any, anything other than directly dependent on Rome, where we're now making cardinals and popes and have churches and stuff like that. That's one thing. And another is um, we are creating a great library that will be a, an, an enormous resource for generations to come, which was not our 
of us, yeah. I want to go back and ask you a question about the bombing in, in 1944. Did the residents of Lamont at the time get a heads up that this was coming, that they could vacate it, or were they just coming yes. as well? Yeah, the monks, the monks had been told that this is a dangerous place and we'll probably get bombed. Uh, and on the day before, uh, airplanes went over and dropped leaflets saying, tomorrow we're going to blow you off the face of the earth so I'd get out of here if I were you. There were m uh, many of the monks um, had left, but uh, uh, the abbot and a substantial number, sort of 20-ish monks, said, we're not leaving here. This is our monastery. Fixity is one of the aspects of Benedictine monasticism. You stay where you are. And we're not going anywhere. Uh, at the very last minute, they did when they knew they were going to be bombed. Um, but they, the, but the abbot and his and his monks stayed there partly to say, "There's nobody here." There were German gun emplacements part way down the mountain, but not on the top of the mountain. The Germans, the Germans had said, "We will, we will not occupy the monastery," and they didn't occupy the monastery. But if you're, the, I guess, if you're the American commander and you see this thing up there, uh, you think nobody defending that hill would. Anybody defending that hill would be crazy not to put some, some artillery up on the top, so we're going to blow it up. I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, um, but, Bill, so, I, I, actually, let's, uh, are we going to play bombardment some more? Everybody wants to talk about the bombardment. I want to talk about the monastery in St. Benedict. And then we'll talk about the bombardment. Forgive me. Everybody likes explosions, right? Do you notice it's always the boys who are asking about the bombs? <laughs> Sorry, I have made a couple of enemies here. Um, these very beautiful books, books that we would not otherwise have. This is a, 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 a book of um, uh, Cassiodorus. This is the ideal monastery of Vibarium, a very famous text of Cassiodorus. Here's a medicinal book that gives the names of, and descriptions of all the herbs and what they're good for. This is a very famous illustrated book by Rabanus Maurus called De Rerum Natura. It's all about the whole, the whole description of the natural world with lots and lots of pictures. Um, a fam very famous uh, music manuscript, a, a, a book of writings about music, the largest medieval collection of writings about music anywhere. So there are a lot of things. Here is a picture of St. Gregory and Peter. Uh, Peter is the deacon whom the, this is actually Gregory's uh, moralia in the, his comment, commentary on the book of Job. But it's a picture of Gregory and Peter the deacon who is the person to whom the dialogue, with whom the dialogues take place. And it's in a dialogue with this Peter the deacon that Gregory uh, tells the story of the life of St. Benedict. And so this is the guy from whom we know everything we know about the life of St. Benedict. Here is a, a, uh, the, beginning, the beginning of the rule of St. Benedict in, uh, in a very beautiful illustration. There's, here's a style of illustration that started about with Desiderius, with great big interlaced, they had, an, they had another style earlier and there's a manuscript that came down from the north that I think gave them this idea but you see a lot of these um, a lot of these gold gold initials with all with sort of squared off um, alternating colors and lots of interlaces and things uh, made in a lot of different uh, a lot of different manuscripts a lot of different ways but this is th these are these are treasures these are this is a way of showing value and importance, and the book itself. I have no idea how to how to uh, imagine what a book like this um, would be worth in the economy of the 11th century. But you have to consider that it involves. I mean, I'm sorry, this is a Good Shepherd Sunday, but it involves a flock of sheep. Uh, you know, a, a bunch of dead sheep to start with. Um, a lot of gold leaf. A lot of you got. Uh, I don't know. The, the, the uh, a beautifully decorated book like this probably has. Uh, I don't know. Is it is it worth more than a, a great big Mercedes Benz? Probably. Probably actually maybe quite a lot more than that. I I, I don't know. I don't know how they value things. And I think 
one of the most difficult things in economics is deciding the value of things at other times and places because it's all relative. And I don't know how much they didn't. I don't know how much a Mercedes cost in those days. Um, <laughs> another uh, an, uh, another such letter. They really cranked it out. They made lots of books. Uh, not only to make copies for themselves, but on order for other places. Um, this is a very famous uh, um, Life of St. Benedict. Um, uh, the, the second book of, of, uh, of the Dialogues of Gregory. But this one is heavily illustrated. Lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures. This is, this is towards the end where St. Benedict is having, uh, uh, is saying, I gotta get back home. He's having, He's having a discussion with his sister, St. Scholastica. And Scholastica, uh, Scholastica is so into this the theological discussion that she wants him to spend the night. And he says, uh, you may be my sister, but Benedictine monks don't spend the night with women. I got to get home to my monastery. And there's a big storm. She prays to, for something to keep him in. And the storm happens outside the window. And he stays. Anyway, it's a, it's a very cool story. <laughs> Another thing that Monte Cassino was famous for, not just Monte Cassino, but uh, they produced a great many of these wonderful documents called Exultet Rolls. Now, Exultet Roll is not a bakery product. It's a, it's a long scroll on which is written the text of the, for the blessing of the Paschal candle that we just heard if you were here on Holy Saturday. Um, rejoice now, all ye heavenly legions of angels. Exult et jam angelica tur vacerorum. Da 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 da. And it was sung by a deacon in the, in those days from from uh, a pulpit because the candle was so big that you could reach over and light it. And the, uh, and these things were written on long scrolls. Here's a picture of the deacon standing up on the in the pulpit with this scroll coming down here. The text and the music are written on the scroll, and the scroll can actually be quite long. This one's been restored, it's been glued back onto a back. Um, uh, it's arranged in such a way that the pictures are upside down with respect to the words, so that as I sing the exalted from the top of the pulpit and the thing unrolls, you see the pictures right side up. I think we should make one for next year. Um, <laughs> And um, it's pretty long, so I don't really know how it works, how it works when it just tumbles down on the floor. Anyhow, this is the tomb of St. Benedict. And it was decorated in, in 1913 or so and been restored by the monks of St. Meinrad's Abbey, Abbey in Germany. So it's very, very, uh, I don't know, Clint looking. Um, the, and miraculously, the urns containing the relics of St. Benedict and the urn containing the, the uh, urns of St. Scholastica were preserved in the bombardment and they've been put back where they belong. Unless you happen to be French, in which case maybe you know that in fact in the 7th century, the, uh, a bunch of Normans stole the relics of St. Benedict and took them to, Sambo, uh, to, to Fleury to this monastery called saint benoit sur loire And if you go to saint benoit sur loire they say, yeah, yeah, we have the, we have the relics of St. Benedict right here. So if you go to Monte Cassino, don't say, I hear that the relics of St. Benedict are actually in France. Don't mention that when you go to Monte Cassino. You'll get a long speech about why they aren't. Anyway, so miraculously, the relics of St. Benedict are in two places. And there are two feasts of St. Benedict, one in July and one in March. Never mind. So there's the reality, the complicated, messy, historical reality. And there is the fact that this rule of St. Benedict, wonderful rule of St. Benedict, has inspired people to live in community and dedicate their lives to the praise of God for, for uh, 1,500 years. That's what matters, I think. Um, and this is the rule. This is a, a part of the beginning of the rule. The, uh, about, this is the titles of chapters 
of obedience and stuff like that, and then here's the beginning of another. This is the oldest surviving copy of the rule of St. Benedict from the 8th century. The, it begins, listen, my child, to the precepts of the master. Auscultate ophili. Everybody knows, every Benedictine knows those words. Um, here's a, just a word or two from the prologue, says St. Benedict. Let us therefore now at length rise up as the scripture incites us when it says, Now is the hour for us to arise from sleep. And with our eyes open to the divine light, let us with astonished ears listen to the admonition of God's voice, daily crying out and saying, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And again, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit announces to the churches. And what does the Spirit say? Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And then he goes on to do all sorts of things. Here are some of the titles of the early, of some of the early chapters of the rule of St. Benedict. Um, and he talks about there are other kinds of people who are by themselves. There is want, there's these groups of wandering monks. Don't pay any attention to them. There are small groups of, of pairs of people who go around begging. Not, and then there's Cenobite monks, people like ourselves, who live fixedly in community. Because there were a lot of people wandering around begging, I think, in the 6th century anyway, uh, the idea of fixity being in one place and self-sufficient was something that was important. Anyhow, and then for what kind of person do you need for an abbot? Because the way the community is set up is based entirely on the absolute responsibility of the abbot for the well-being of the community and the absolute obligation of the members of the community to obey the abbot unquestioningly. It sounds sort of fascist to us, maybe, but when he talks about what the abbot needs to worry about when he's looking after his children and the, uh, and the concern he needs to have, we all would like to live in a community with an abbot like that looking after us. We all need the right abbot. And um, St. Benedict describes that person. Concerning the calling of brethren to council, what that means is when the abbot has a problem that he can't figure out, he calls everybody together and everybody says what they think. Here's what I think you ought to do. And then he goes on and says, don't give arguments for your case and don't make your case. Just say what you have to say and stop. You know, Benedict has been around the block a couple of times, you know, he's, uh, he's chaired a couple of meetings, it sounds like. Um, what are the instruments of the Concerning obedience, silence, humility, the things without which the, nothing's going to work. Um, and then he goes on at, at some length to, to say exactly how the liturgy's going to work, how the, how the office hours are going to work, all of the eight office hours of the day and that sort of thing. Um, and there are lots of other parts of the rule that talk about discipline and what do you do if somebody does this and what do you do if somebody does that and so on. But at the core of the rule is, the, uh, is prayer, daily prayer. Seven times a day do I pray to you and in the night I rise. So eight times. So the, your life is divided into sort of three sections. Uh, well, four. You get to sleep. Uh, and it, he cares about his monks. If things don't work, you can make adjustments, he says to the abbot. And there seems to be about seven, seven, seven plus hours of sleep, all the interrupted in the night for the vigils. But there's a reasonable amount of sleep, and the waking hours are divided roughly evenly among prayer and reading, Lectio Divina, um, uh, and some kind of work, manual work of various kinds to make the monastery self-sufficient. And it has worked for these 15 or 1600 years. Um, uh, you'll be aware, I think, that the only monastic organization in, in Western culture, until the 13th century, when we begin to have mendicant orders, Franciscans and Dominicans and others, um, was Benedictine. It was the only kind of monk there was, essentially, in, in Western Christianity up until the 13th century. Men and women, and lots of them, elected to live this kind of life in community, praising God seven times a day and getting up in the night to do it. 
Interestingly, he says nothing about the mass. The assumption seems to be that most of the monasteries for whom the rule is going to be used are, are, are not priests. They're just people who gather together, live together, support each other, and pray. Praise God all day long. Um, that gradually changes, of course, and things happen. And some monasteries backslide, and then we have reforms. Reforms of the Benedictine order. We have Cistercians here, and we have uh, other kinds here. But they're all kind of trying to, trying very hard to interpret the rule as well as they can. Uh, some some get very rich. Some stay poor. But what's remarkable is that that rule of Benedict has has been sufficient to to keep uh, to keep communities together, well alive and praying for 1,500 years so far, and maybe well for 1,500 years more. I sure hope so. Do go, do go and visit. You don't, don't worry about the ugly dome. Do go and visit the monastery of Monte Cassino when you're anywhere near Italy, and um, I think you'll, I think you'll, you'll feel the presence, the presence of 1,500 years worth of prayers with a few destructions in between. <laughs> so let's stop there and see if anybody has any complaints or questions. Yes. Sir. Well, there's no public role for the monastery or the monks. They're not enclosed particularly, but they're, they are not like uh, the preaching order of, of Dominicans or like the mendicants of the Franciscan. What they do is praise God. Nevertheless, it's true that, all, that, that Benedict requires all monasteries to welcome guests. Welcome guests as if they were Christ. And every Benedictine convent or monastery has guest quarters. Has 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 as it's part of the rule. You have to receive guests. Sometimes there are limits on how many can be received, but um, but that hospitality to the stranger is part of the rule of Saint Benedict. So it's that is a function. Most uh, almost all monasteries nowadays have services all day long in a big church to which the public may come. Um, but that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to be a community apart from the world, praising God. It might seem weird to us who feel social and other responsibilities, but that's what it is. Um, and uh, the, the public duty is completely secondary. I, look, I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not a Benedictine monk. Um, and so please don't you go home and, and find out the real answer. I'm telling you the way I, my poor understanding allows me to understand it, which may be completely off the mark. Um, yeah. You said they're self-sustaining. Is that true today? And how do they do it? Because where were they growing their food? Or? Well, um, one of the things about the Middle Ages is that people gave huge amounts of money to monasteries. Um, we live in the Middle Ages nowadays in a, way, in a way. We have institutions where people wear funny clothes and insulate themselves from the world, and we don't quite know what they do in there, but we know that we give them money. We call them hospitals and universities and stuff like that. Well, they had, in the Middle Ages, institu uh, institutions that did important things. What they, what they mostly do is pray for the repose of the souls of the dead. And if you'd like somebody to pray for your uh, soul, you ask the monks to do it, and they say, we'll do it. And you also make a substantial offer. But would they buy food with that? Or how would they you, well, you're supposed to. In principle, you should be self-sustaining. Raise your own food. But I don't know where they could do it. They're right up there on the boat. Well, see, uh, it doesn't take long before people admire them, and then and when they die, they give their farm to the monastery. Okay. Or they give the income from their farm farm to the monastery, or they give their child to the monastery, or they give um, people, uh, monasteries, some monasteries became enormous 
obviously, maybe even obscenely wealthy. So people were sometimes uh, really objecting to the Benedictines, the Black Friars, because they had so much money. They didn't ask for it, but well, um, I don't know how it works. Um, but uh, in principle, according to Benedict, it should be self-sustaining which is why you work. You might sell things, you might do your own agriculture, make your own shoes, make your own candles, do every, make your own parchment. Um, but if others, if others want you to pray for them and want you to, want you to be at, uh, free to do so, you're not forbidden to receive gifts from the outside. Bill, you know? I've got really two questions. The first relates to this 
I mean, I, I suppose I suppose somebody could construct an argument that all that so-called looting of art by the Germans um, was simply a way of making it safe. You're the art guy. I mean, didn't they didn't they take an awful lot of art and take it off to Germany for for safekeeping? You might say. Yeah, but in this off the case, walls of all those Jewish families and things like that. In this case, uh, that officer didn't um, oh. take it to Germany, take that library to Germany, and I, I'm just wondering. I mean, clearly we had some bad intelligence. We the Allies had bad intelligence. Um, you can you give us a little bit more about the black hats and the white hats and the gray hats? There's a number of books. You start, you start with Herbert Block, a professor at Harvard, who wrote a little booklet about the bombardment of Monte Cassino. And in recent years, there have been several big, not big, but book-sized books about the, uh, about the Battle of Monte Cassino, they sometimes call it. There's a lot to be said, and there are a lot of actors, um, and there's a lot of discussion among the Allies about should we, should we, should we not. It's a really complicated and very, very interesting story, particularly if you love Monte Cassino, as I do. But anybody here who thinks they might like to go to church, well, when is church? Yeah. Oh, so we can go on for another couple of minutes. I was thinking, yeah, I go to, I go to 8 o'clock. I have no idea what time you people go to church. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm sorry, other, other questions? Well, okay, take out a piece of paper and, you, and write the following Beneventum script. <laughs> Okay, thank you all very much for coming. Oh, sorry. I find to be uh, fascinating with the monastery today, so it has less than a dozen monks, who live inside the Protestant side of the world. There are many people who now give a voice to the rule of Benedict. Yes. And they, I mean, Catherine Morris, Well, in the in the sixth century, I guess you'd say that uh, that the rule of Benedict was for uh, Christians, for Western Christians at least. Um, uh, the the Great Schism hadn't happened yet. You know, there was there was Christians and there was Christians, and we are Christians. Benedict is a man of uh, is a man of great wisdom and great spirituality. Pay pay attention to him; you'll learn a lot. Protestant or not? Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. That, just what, please go ahead. It was chanting, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk next week to probably nobody here. Nobody that's here will come back. But I'm going to talk next week a lot about chanting and about the history of Gregorian chant and about the monastery in France that kind of revived and restored and studied the Gregorian chant. But essentially, everything they did in church, all those eight office hours and the mass when they get to it, everything that you would hear at any of those services was what we would call song. There was nothing but music. We make a distinction between the word chant and the word singing as though they were different things. But in any other language, it's the same word, canto, canto, canto in Italian, chant, the chant grégorien, un chant populaire in French. It just means they sang. Everything was sung. Everything. Short answer. Well, you say everybody. I didn't say everybody. Okay, so, well, my question is, like, has that changed? Is there outreach from the monasteries now? I imagine there must be poor people who live around these rich monasteries. And just that uh, mindset of, you know, these small number of people who are receiving a lot of resources and not giving back anything to the community has that changed? And, and also, what was the, how did that mindset continue? That seems so obscure.
depends on what monastery you ask and when you ask it, and uh, there are all sorts of variables. Uh, but I think the idea, it's like the, you know, the, the problem about indulgences. The idea is that you are grateful if somebody prays for the repose of the soul of your grandmother. And, and that can be abused. But, the, but the, the intention itself, there's nothing wrong with the intention itself, but you can imagine how the abuse could grow and the people would like it. Um, monastery, Benedictine monasteries still do not feel, are, are not compelled by the rule to do the kind of outreach that other monastic orders are founded specifically to do, like nurse the sick, or whatever. That's not the deal. But the, the, the biggest Benedictine monastery in the world right now, I think, is St. Meinrad's, St. what's it called, in uh, Collegeville, Minnesota. Um, very big, and they have a college, and they have a high school and they educate thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they have a, the Hill Monastic uh, Manuscript Library where they, where they collect facsimiles of all the manuscripts they can find from monasteries all around the world, not just Benedictine. And that, that, that collection is open to scholars from all around the world. They do all sorts of things that I think you would call outreach. Um, and I don't know, I think they think it's an appropriate part of what they do. But uh, it's maybe a, a very big expansion of the fact that monasteries welcome people in and educate them, as well as training them up in, as novices to be monks. There's a long waiting period. And Benedict wants, to, wants you to be absolutely sure before you make your solemn vows. So you, you, can, you can be a novice for a while, but it's a good long time before they let you in. Because they're, you know, you can imagine, you say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure I like this. And you don't want to have taken your solemn vows and have to untake them. But, but the education, the bringing people in, I mean, of course, a monastery only survives by having more people come. So there is always an outward facing part of it, but it's not, it's not thought of as recruiting. It's just sort of, if you're, if you're interested in knowing what we do, come, try, come for a retreat whenever you like. Come and stay in our guest house. You want to you make a confession to a monk? You want a spiritual guidance? You want something or other? We are happy to do that for you. But they don't put up a sign saying, here's what we offer. <laughs> so, I don't know. Thank you all very much again.